Hi, I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and I'm here to talk to you about Tolkien. I'd like to propose that Tolkien's valor are one of the most commonly misunderstood parts of his lore. Too often, they're brushed aside as just, you know, Tolkien's version of the Greek gods, and that's really not the full picture. And that's such a shame, because the full picture is fascinating, and digging a little deeper into this pantheon can tell us a lot about Tolkien's skill as a storyteller. So today we are going to talk about every single one of the Valar, including some of the ones you might not have heard about before, and we're going to discuss their characters, their role in the Legendarium, and the real-world myths and legends that inspired them. But first things first, what are the Valar? Well, they were the first thing that the creator of Middle-earth, Eru Iluvatar, brought into being. This first group of spirits that contained the Valar were called the Ainur. The Ainur are kind of gods, but they're more comparable to angels, particularly in Catholic theology, as these disembodied spirits with some amount of free will who were made to serve the god that created them. And the first real act within Middle-earth, beyond just this initial creation of other beings, was called the Song of the Ainur. The spirits that were created began to sing into the void, and through the harmonization of their voices, they began to establish relationships between each other, to grow in knowledge of each other, and to grow in knowledge of the mind of their creator. The song was beautiful and harmonious and pure, until one of the most powerful spirits, Melkor, decided he wanted to make his own tune. His song was discordant against the rest of the song of the Ainur, and they had to compensate, battling this new melody with their song. The song that they created became more fearsome and hardier than it ever could have been without this discord to fight against. It was made even more strong and even more beautiful by this conflict. And when that final harmonious note of the song rings out, Eru Iluvatar shows the Ainur what they have done. Their collective music has prefigured all of time and space. The song acted as a map for all of the history that was about to unfold, and in that instant, Arda, as we know it, springs into being. If you'd like to hear more detail about the Song of the Ainur, I talk about it a lot in the full video that I made all about Tolkien's music, so I'll leave that in the description if you want to check it out after you finish watching this video. Once the world was created, Luvatar gave the Ainur a choice. They could remain with him outside of the world, or they could choose to enter in and participate in time and space. Many stayed with Iluvatar, but those that went into Arda came to be known by two different groups. The Valar, the more powerful pantheon of spirits, and the Maiar, the group of less powerful spirits. I will touch on the Maiar a little bit, but they are definitely a full topic for another day. Now there are 15 Valar that entered Arda. Technically, the first one to arrive was Melkor, the one that had created the discord in the Song of the Ainur. He would become known as Morgoth, the greatest and most foul enemy within Middle-earth. And most of the Valar considered him to be, um, like, you know, kind of a jerk, so he's gonna be saved for another video as well. But that leaves us with 14 Valar to discuss. Each of them has their own personality and skills and interpersonal relationships, despite some of them being more thoroughly developed and explored within the Legendarium than others. But even so, there are some very, very interesting lessons to be learned from these lesser Valar. So with the basics covered, let's start with Irmo, the Lord of Visions and Dreams. Irmo lives in Lorien, a place called the Land of Dreams, and he's often just called Lorien instead of Irmo. Tolkien writes of him, In Lorien are his gardens in the land of the Valar, and they are the fairest of all places in the world, filled with many spirits. He and his brother are known as the Feanturi, or the Masters of Spirits, which sets them firmly apart from the other Valar. For the other Valar, their talents lie in the physical world, whereas the Feanturi are masters of the spirit world. Lorien's home is kind of like the 
ultimate spa. The gardens are maintained as a place of peaceful rest and healing with the help of Lorien's spouse. It's a place for the truly weary and wounded to find solace and a release from pain. The most prominent example of this is Feanor's mother, who, after his birth, goes on a downward spiral and wishes for death. This was unheard of amongst the immortal elves, so they did the only thing that they could think of and put her within Lorien's care. She ended up dying, but the peace of Lorien allowed her to pass gently and release some of the pain that she had been feeling. The lands of Lorien were so universally adored by both Valar and Elfkind alike that when Galadriel settled in Middle-earth, she called her own lands Lothlorien in respect to Lorien's gardens. I believe that Tolkien synthesized a couple of different myths in order to get Lorien. The Greek god Morpheus comes to mind, as he was associated with sleep and dreams. However, he played more the role of a shapeshifter, able to traverse through people's dreams and guide their sleep. And this is nice, but when it comes to Lorien, we don't have any textual evidence that he's able to travel into people's dreams. Although that would be pretty cool. Instead, I think that the Greek god Hypnos may have been a larger inspiration. Hypnos kind of acted as a shepherd to human sleep, guiding them and guarding them while they were in that state of vulnerability. Tolkien took these kind of vague notions of dreams and sleep and distilled them down into the one character that he needed, a character that could provide a place of rest and relaxation for the people of Middle-earth. But if rest was provided by Lorien, then healing was provided by his spouse, Este. Este is the greatest and most gentle healer of Arda. And Tolkien writes, She walks not by day, but sleeps upon an island in the tree-shadowed lake of Lorelin. From the fountains of Irma and Este, all those who dwell in Valinor draw refreshment. She is the other half of Lorien's regenerative power, the gentle, healing hand that soothes all ills. She and Irmo were the defenders of sleep and rest when Varda first created the sun and moon. Originally, the sun and moon were created to hang in the sky simultaneously, creating a perpetual and endless day. But Este and her spouse reminded Varda of the importance of night for sleep and healing. Varda took their counsel, and their beautiful garden, which had begun to shrivel in the unrelenting light, flourished once more. I believe that the closest parallel for Este can be found in the Greek goddess Hygieia. Hygieia was the patron of healing and hygiene, with a particular dedication to extending the lifespans of humans as well as their quality of life. This aligns pretty neatly to the skills and goals of Este, but of course, Tolkien puts his own spin on it by linking this healing to sleep. Este and Lorien dedicated themselves to maintaining the spirits and bodies of the denizens of Middle-earth, but once those spirits had finally slipped from their bodies, they went to the halls of Lorien's brother, Namo. Namo dwelled in the halls called Mandos, and is known most commonly as Mandos. He is the keeper of the houses of the dead, and the summoner of the spirits of the slain. He forgets nothing, and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that still lie in the freedom of Iluvatar. Mandos was one of the Adatar, the most powerful of the Valar. He is the guardian and shepherd of dead souls, but his more important role is that of the impartial judge. Aside from Manwe, the chief of the Valar, Mandos has the most complete knowledge of Iluvatar's plan. This places him in a role that I think is similar to the biblical prophet. The role of the prophet was not to bring doom upon sinful people, but rather to remind sinners of the consequences of their actions. Mandos's intimate knowledge of both their creator and the things that were created allows him to be the voice of judgment of Iluvatar, warning people and Valar alike when they are straying from a righteous path. For example, after the elf lord Feanor commits the kinslaying, he pronounces what is called the Doom of Mandos. He warns Feanor and his followers that if they continue what they are doing, it will result in tears unnumbered for them and their offspring. This turns out to be true, and Feanor and his followers suffer some of the worst 
fates imaginable. But it's important to realize that this wasn't a curse or punishment doled out by Mandos in Iluvatar's name. It was simply a warning, Mandos making clear the consequences of Feanor's freely chosen actions. It's easier to see this more gentle side of Mandos when we look at another instance of him in the Legendarium, in the tale of Beren and Luthien. Luthien, an immortal and beautiful elven princess, falls in love with Beren, a mortal man. They go through many trials together, strengthening their love, but before they're able to live in peace together, Beren is tragically killed. Luthien's grief over his death is so profound that her soul leaves her physical body and goes to the halls of Mandos. There, she prostrates herself before the Lord of the Dead, lamenting and mourning the loss of Beren. For the first time in the history of Arda, rather than observing, Mandos chooses to intercede. His heart is swayed by her grief, and he takes her plight to Iluvatar and Manwe, and asks that this injustice be rectified. Then, according to the will of Iluvatar, Mandos gives Luthien the ultimate choice. She could live in a state of bliss in Valinor for the rest of time, or she could bring Beren back to life, and they could both live one single mortal life together and then die. Luthien chooses her love, and this is a clear example of how Mandos is clear-headed and obstinate and fixed upon justice, but he's far from cruel. He has a great deal of love and mercy for the creations of Iluvatar, both in spite of and because of his intimate knowledge of Iluvatar's plan for them. Considering all of this, I think it's interesting that he's often compared to the Greek god Hades. Hades was, like Mandos, the keeper of the souls of the dead, and sometimes acted in a bit of a judiciary role. But throughout myth, he remains as a kind of aloof figure. He is cold and mysterious, and never, ever swayed by any degree of begging or petitioning. So through Mandos, Tolkien humanizes the character of Hades. We get to see the kind of inner machinations of why Mandos makes the choices that he makes, and in one rare instance, we see him swayed by someone's grief. Tolkien also uses Mandos to rewrite some traditional, particularly Greek notions of fate, but we can better explore these ideas in the mysterious spouse of Mandos, Vaira. While introducing Vaira, Tolkien writes, She weaves all things that have ever been in time into her storied webs, and the halls of Mandos that ever widen as the ages pass are clothed with them. Vaira's role is as the storyteller, or truly the historian of Middle-earth. She watches everything that passes, the good, the bad, and the evil, and weaves them together into the tapestry of time. Especially considering her association with Mandos, I think that Vaira is a fascinating parallel to the Greek Morai, or the Fates. The three Fates of Greek myth were responsible for watching over the life of every single human being, and ensuring that they were following the path that destiny had set out for them. They watched the thread of a person's life spin out, guided it into their predetermined, predestined path, and when the time came, they were the ones who snipped that thread and ended the mortal person's life. Vaira, in comparison, doesn't need to take on such an active role. Rather than guiding or governing the thread of life, she records it into her tapestries as it goes. She watches the story spin out, not from above the timeline, but from within it. Through Vaira and Mandos, Tolkien rewrites traditional notions of fate and destiny. These concepts exist in Middle-earth, but it is with nowhere near the rigidity that you see with Hades and the Morai. The Valar are not governing or controlling the path of mankind, they are part of it. Their very intimate knowledge of creation allows them to understand some of what may be, but only Iluvatar truly knows the details of his plan. I couldn't come up with a, a good transition for this next one, so um... You know who really doesn't understand the inner machinations of Iluvatar's plan? Tulkas, the muscle of the Valar. I don't have any muscles. Now, Tulkas was a latecomer to Middle-earth, arriving over a thousand years after the other Valar when he heard that they were in conflict with Morgoth. 
He, he basically just wanted to fight a guy. He's incredibly strong, and he delights in wrestling and in contests of strength. And he rides no steed, for he can outrun all things that go on feet. And he is tireless. Now, Tulkas may not be the world's best conversationalist or give the greatest advice, but he's an incredibly loyal friend to those that he chooses to be friends with. Tolkien basically hints at him being, like, dumber than a bag of rocks, but that just makes him a himbo. And in this house, we love himbos. When he first arrived in Middle-earth, it was a turning point for that first war between the Valar and Morgoth. Morgoth was actually very close to winning, but at the mere sound of Tulkas's laughter and the sight of his silhouette on the horizon, he turned tail and fled, putting himself into exile. Tulkas is kind of like the classroom bully to Morgoth. You know, not that he didn't kind of deserve it, but they would remain in conflict throughout the rest of the history of Arda. During the War of Powers, Tulkas wrestled Morgoth hand to hand, and when he won, he chained him basically to the pits of hell. It's prophesized that in the great battle at the end of time called Dagor Dagoroth, Tulkas and Morgoth will face off once again in hand to hand combat for the fate of the universe. We don't know exactly how this battle goes, but we do know that Tulkas is ultimately not the one that kills Morgoth, so suffice to say, it's probably not an easy victory for Tulkas. There are a few possible mythic comparisons for Tulkas, the most obvious being Hercules of Greek myth. I mean, they, they both certainly fit the muscly himbo category. I also think we can find some parallels in the early parts of Beowulf. You know, where the, the strong man is called in from a distant land to help the king deal with the evil beast. However, I think that the most rewarding comparison is to the Norse god Thor. Thor, like Tulkas, was a supernaturally strong, kinda dumb brawler. Thor was exceedingly brave and loyal to the people that he loved, and he was called in when they were in need of some muscle. Thor was also destined to play a big role in Ragnarok, the giant battle at the end of time that Tolkien based his Dagor Dagoroth off of. Just as Tulkas was going to be wrestling Morgoth, Thor was going to face off against Jormungand, the evil world serpent. Thor would win, though the conflict would eventually kill him. Thor was an interesting character in Norse mythology because although he was a, a, a loyal and firm protector, he wasn't exactly a, a perfect guy. He started a lot of wars, shed a lot of unnecessary blood, and drank, like, a lot of alcohol while doing these things. And listen, what you do on the weekends, hey, that, that's on you. But he's not exactly, like, a stand-up guy. So although Tulkas is less well-fleshed out than Thor, I kind of see him as a polished up version of the original Norse character. Tulkas doesn't need fancy weapons and armor, or unnecessary wars, or a ton of bloodshed. He has his fists, and he has his one great enemy, and he's not gonna rest until he kills that enemy with his bare hands. He's the kind of simplified and purified version of Thor that Tolkien thought would serve his world. There is one more aspect to Tulkas's character, though, and that is his romance and subsequent marriage to the Valar, Nessa. She's one of the least powerful Valar, but Tolkien writes, Dear, she loves, and they follow her train whenever she goes into the wild, but she can outrun them, swift as an arrow with the wind in her hair. In dancing she delights, and she dances in Valimar, on lawns of never-fading green. She seems to be a free spirit and a lover of nature, and I can't help but think that she and Tukas make a very cute couple. Based on what little we know about her, the best comparison I can find for her is probably Sif, Thor's wife from Norse mythology. Sif is also a bit under the radar, but what we know of her, she is a great lover of nature. I also think that Tolkien may have brought in elements of Celtic mythology here, particularly the god Kernunos. He was a wise and ancient spirit of the forest, known for his close relation with deer. I think we can, on like the most basic of levels, find elements of Greek fauns or satyrs. If you take fauns and satyrs and very purposefully ignore all of their 
terrifying debauchery, we get this idea of a people associated with um, fast four-legged animals that love dancing and music. Nessa is truly just the amalgamation of all of these different mythic ideas, and she is closely associated with her brother, the Valar Orome. Orome was one of the greater Aratar known as the Huntsman. Tolkien writes, he is a hunter of monsters and fell beasts, and he delights in horses and in hounds and all trees he loves. He's less physically mighty than Tulkas, but he has a much more fearsome temper. Tulkas also has an immense love for Middle-earth and those within it, and has a closer connection to Iluvatar's people than any of the other Valar. When Morgoth took over Middle-earth, killing many of the plants and animals and overrunning the place with shadows, Orome was one of the only Valar that would return. He rode his great white horse Nahar through the darkened forests, slaying shadows and beasts with his pack of trained hounds. While on one of these hunts, he was the first Valar to discover the elves who had just woken under the stars in Quivenin. He acted as a guide and a friend to them, dubbing them the Eldar and leading them to safer pastures in Beleriand. Later on, Orome was instrumental to leading the elves safely to Valinor, as they had built up a close relationship of trust. Orome's love for Middle-earth as a physical place led to him being one of the closest defenders of the elves, often competing directly against Morgoth himself to ensure the safety of his Eldar. I believe that the best comparison for Orome would be the Welsh god Araun. Araun was an immortal and powerful hunter with a close connection to the Welsh myth of the Otherworld. This idea of the Otherworld is used in a lot of other myths, but it's basically another spiritual second realm kind of in parallel to our physical world. In one story, Araun befriends the human King Puish and allows him passage to the other world. This is a fantastic parallel to Orome, who is also a great and legendary hunter and led the human equivalent people to Valinor, which could be considered a sort of other world within the context of Middle-earth. But I think the clearest example is just Orome's name, which in the original Elvish Sindarin is Arau, which is just one letter off from Araun. Once again, we see Tolkien adopting elements of mythological precedents, but then reinterpreting them to fit into his world. We see this inspiration go even further with Orome's spouse, Bana the ever young. Little is known about Vana, but Tolkien writes that all flowers spring as she passes, and open if she glances upon them, and all birds sing at her coming. She is both eternally youthful and incredibly lovely, and she brings the beauty of blooming flowers to the world. I found a fascinating comparison for Vana in the character Bledewith from the same Welsh mythic cycle as Araun. I'm definitely butchering these Welsh pronunciations, but um please know that I am fighting for my very life. Bladewith was literally created to be made out of flowers, to be the perfect wife of a man who had been cursed that he couldn't marry an actual human woman. Because she was made out of flowers, she was supernaturally beautiful. However, this beauty would become a problem as she strayed from her husband and fell in love with the warrior hunter, Grono. This story does go very sharply downhill as Blade with and Gronu team up to kill her husband in an incredibly gruesome way. But that just goes to show how Tolkien took these original myths and looked at what he liked and what he didn't like and rewrote them according to the rules of his world. He took the trope of the beautiful, eternally youthful maiden, but instead made her already married to the warrior hunter of her dreams. However, these characters don't just draw from one mythological source, and Vana could also be compared to the Greek spring goddess Persephone, especially when you take take into account her older sister, Yavanna. Yavanna is known as Kementari, which means queen of the earth, and she is the lover of all things that grow in the earth, and all their countless forms she holds in her mind, from the trees like towers in forests long ago, to the moss upon stones, or the small and secret things in the mold. Yavanna is one of the Aratar, and she plays an important role in shaping Middle-earth as we know it. Working with the waters of Ulmo, the air of Manwe, and the light of Varda to craft a full and blooming world. 
When Morgoth first fled, she planted the earth full of seeds of her own making, and plants and trees began growing, fed by the light of the lamps that she had asked to be made. When Morgoth returned from his exile, it was she that was first made aware, as he sent out a poison that killed many of her precious plants. He would take this destruction further, breaking the lamps and plunging the entire world into darkness. The Valar fled Middle-earth to the safety of Valinor, and it was there that Yavanna, aided by the tears of Nienna, began to sing. There came forth two slender shoots, and silence was all over the world in that hour, nor was there any other sound save the chanting of Yavanna. Under her song the saplings grew and became fair and tall and came to flower, and thus there arose in the world the two trees of Valinor. Meanwhile, in Middle-earth, she put all the plants and animals into a deep sleep in order to keep them safe from the rampaging of Morgoth. And this was when she began to realize what a delicate world she had created. She knew of the elves and dwarves and humans that would come to lord over Middle-earth one day, and worried about what their dominion would do to her plants and trees. She brought these fears to Iluvatar, who then allowed her to create a guardian for the living world. Yavanna breathed life into her favorite creation, trees, and thus awoke the Ents, who would forever be guardians and shepherds to nature within Middle-earth. Later on, she was also responsible for sending a Maya spirit into the world, who would become known as Radagast. Though he may not have involved himself in the greater affairs of Middle-earth as much as he could have, I firmly believe that he did what Yavanna wanted him to do in the world, acting as a voice for the voiceless natural world. Considering that Yavanna was one of the more well-developed Valar, it's a little bit difficult to find a one-to-one -one comparison for her within mythology, but she's definitely reminiscent of the Greek goddess Demeter. Demeter was the patron of growing things on Earth, of plants and agriculture and all of life. She also had a daughter, Persephone, who was bright and and youthful, and essentially the personification of spring, which may parallel her relationship with her younger sister, Vanna. However, I think that Yavanna draws from a very vast mythological inspiration, from the Irish prototypical mother goddess Danu to the Basque goddess Amalur, even to modern interpretations of the Mother Nature or Mother Earth. And all of these inspirations came together with a hefty dash of Tolkien's own thoughts and concerns about the natural world. Tolkien was deeply upset by the destruction of nature in favor of 20th century industrialization and pollution. This began at a very early age when he was forced to leave the idyllic country town of his youth and moved to heavily industrialized Birmingham. His concern for the natural world, especially trees, is a resounding theme in his work, and he created Yavanna to personify these feelings. For him, nature needed a guardian, someone who would never fail to make the earth their priority and their first thought, and Yavanna, the goddess who encompasses these feelings, is one of the most powerful Valar in his world. Considering Yavanna's proclivity for the natural world and her fear of industrialization, it is fascinating that Tolkien made her spouse Aule, the smith of the Valar. He's one of the ultra-powerful Aratar, and he is a smith and a master of all crafts, and he delights in works of skill, however small, as much as in the mighty building of old. Aule desired little more than to craft, to build new things that had never been created, and he has dominion over all of the rocks and minerals and metals of Middle-earth. It was he that created the lamps that Yavanna needed for her plants to flourish, he that made the chains that would imprison Morgoth, and eventually he made the vessels that would hold the moon and sun in the sky. And Aule loved creating so much that he created the seven dwarf lords in secret. He wanted someone to teach, the perfect pupil that could go out and create like he creates, and he modeled them on the vague shape and form of the elves that he had seen during the Song of the Ainur. However, after creating the dwarves, Aule realized his hubris and threw himself down at the feet of Eru Iluvatar. He understood that it was not his role to create life, and weeping, he raised up his great hammer 
to kill the dwarves that he had created. But before he could kill them, Iluvatar halted his hand and granted that although it was not wise of him to create them, now that they had been created, they shouldn't be destroyed. So instead, Iluvatar put them to sleep until he could wake them up later and integrate them into his plan. This incident highlights one of Aule's most important qualities, his endless humility. Tolkien writes, The delight and pride of Aule is in the deed of making, and in the thing made, and neither in the possession nor in his own mastery. Wherefore he gives and hoards not, and is free from care, passing ever on to some new work. He did not create the dwarves to usurp Iluvatar's creative power, but to create more creators. This is why, although Aule could definitely be compared with some mythic blacksmithing gods such as the Greek Hephaestus or the Irish Lu, he stands out as particularly important within the thematic shape of Middle-earth as a whole. Early on, one of Aule's students was Myron, the Maya. Myron was an excellent learner, but he became too selfish. He didn't create things for the, for the joy of creation or just so that something new would exist in the world. He created things so that he could control them. Later on, Myron would abandon the light entirely, join forces with Morgoth, and become Sauron. Thus, Aule and Sauron are foils of each other. They both relish in creating, but compared to Sauron's selfish, possessive creations, Aule's are entirely selfless. Aule is the ultimate sub-creator, creating things in parallel to the ultimate creator, Eru Iluvatar, but never seeking to surpass, control, or take any of the glory away from the original creator. This idea of the sub-creator was immensely important to Tolkien's own personal philosophy. It's how he viewed himself, as well as any other authors of true fantasy as he defined it. Tolkien was creating another secondary world inside the world that had already been created by the Christian god, never dreaming to surpass that original creation, but rather to enhance and illuminate its beauty. Aule is the ideal maker, the ideal sub-creator that Tolkien wanted to see in the world. But to contrast the pure joy of creation that Aule brought into the world, there had to be some sorrow. And at the heart of sorrow within Middle-earth is Nienna. Nienna is the Valar that mourns. Tolkien writes, She dwells alone. She is acquainted with grief and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered in the marring of Melkor. So great was her sorrow as the music unfolded that her song turned to lamentation long before its end and the sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. Nienna literally wove sorrow into the very threads of the universe, and she embodies this grief entirely. She lives alone, wandering the halls of Mandos with the spirits of the dead. However, in that place with those spirits, Nienna is well loved. Those in grief see her tears as company in their agony, as pity that is greatly needed. She is the bleeding heartstring of the Valar, the release of all of the wretched pain stored up in the world, and an endless outpouring of mercy. She was even able to find some pity for Morgoth, and she interceded for him when he came before Manwe to beg for his freedom. And although this pity may have been misguided, she still plays an important role as the empathy of the Valar. The outpouring of her tears allowed for the trees of Valinor to grow, and she truly characterizes unselfish empathy, even if that empathy means she'll never stop weeping. Nienna could be compared to the Greek character Niobe, who was punished for her hubris by the death of all 14 of her children. Niobe is so torn apart by this that she weeps and weeps until she turns to stone, left to sob eternally. The key difference here is that Nienna doesn't weep for her own sins, but for the sorrow of all of Arda. Rather than looking back into myth to characterize her, I think we should just look deeper into the legendarium, to the Maya Alorin. He dwelled with Nienna and learned much from her before he was sent to Middle-earth as the wizard 
Gandalf. Within the narrative, Gandalf personifies the most important elements of Nienna's character. He shows a depth of care and wisdom and profoundly unselfish love that can be found seldom elsewhere in Middle-earth. He takes the plight and worries of the whole world onto his shoulders, and though he may suffer and complain from it, just as Nienna weeps endlessly, he bears it. Throughout The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, he spreads Nienna's message again and again. When Frodo wonders why Bilbo showed pity to something as despicable as Gollum, Gandalf reminds him of the importance of pity. How just a touch of mercy, even if it seems unwise, may make all the difference. Gandalf allows the Balrog to drag him down to a fiery grave just so that the others can continue on their quest. And at the Grey Havens, he reminds the hobbits that not all pain is wrong. I will not say, do not weep, he says, for not all tears are evil. Nienna exists as a reminder that empathy never goes misplaced, and that sorrow is an inherent part of life. It is perhaps a sobering reminder, but it's one that's desperately needed. The only other Valar that lives as solitary of a life as Nienna is Ulmo, the Lord of the Seas. He is an Aratar, the most powerful of the Valar outside of Manwe, and he dwells nowhere long, but moves as he will in all the deep waters about the earth or under the earth. Ulmo has a special connection to music, and he was instructed deeper than all the others in the depths of music. This establishes him as having an eye towards the future. Particularly in the case of the Valar, who were there when the Song of the Ainur was sung, knowledge of music means knowledge of the story of the world. It's not that he was prescient or anything. This isn't Dune, but his intimate knowledge of music gives him a deeper connection to what could be. Perhaps because of this extra awareness, Hulmo is the most solitary Valar. He has no spouse and rarely attends large meetings of the Valar and Maiar, except in incidents of world-changing decisions. He rarely takes any physical form at all, instead existing in all of the waters of Arda at once, and taking the form of a great wave when the situation calls for it. By embodying all the, the waters, the seas, the rivers, the lakes of Arda, Ulmo keeps a close, ever-present eye on all events. When the Valar flee to Valinor, leaving Morgoth to ravage Middle-earth, it is only Ulmo who fully remains. Orome and Yavanna pass through on their business, but Ulmo bides his time and waits and watches. Perhaps due to his knowledge and understanding of the future of Iluvatar's plan, he keeps a special eye on the elves. Ulmo is the only Valar that suggests that it might be best for them to leave the elves to do as they wish rather than interfering. He's overruled, but he does what he can to help all the same, tearing a chunk of land off of Valerian to transport them across the sea, eventually anchoring this new island in the Bay of Eldemar. There's a kind of obvious comparison to be made between Ulmo and the Greek god Poseidon. They both embody the seas and take on the form of great waves. However, throughout Greek myth, Poseidon is much more volatile and short-tempered than Ulmo. He's often very vindictive, doling out punishments when he thinks that people have done wrong, whereas Ulmo is much more the restrained observer. So while there are definitely some superficial similarities, the thematic cores of these characters differ significantly. You could also find some parallels in the Norse god Gefjun, who once took a piece of land, transported it across the sea, and anchored it into a new bay. You could even look at Saint Elmo of Christian tradition, who was the patron saint of sailors, and has a name that sounds suspiciously close to Ulmo. It's in these larger, more developed characters like Ulmo that we get to see Tolkien's full creativity at play. He may take visuals and events and some themes from these mythic characters, but he's not afraid to effectively mold them into an entirely new character. He needed a Valar to keep guard over Middle-earth, someone who would watch and take in everything with a careful eye and ensure that Iluvatar's plan was 
going according to plan. There wasn't an exact precedence in storytelling for that character, so Tolkien created him anew, making him look familiar, but serve an entirely different purpose. He created Ulmo to watch from the greatest depths, but from the heavens, he has Varda, who is called the Lady of the Stars. Varda is the spouse of Manwe, one of the Aratar, and one of the most powerful and beautiful creatures in Middle-earth. Too great is her beauty to be declared in the words of men or elves, for the light of Iluvatar lives still in her face. In light is her power and joy. She's the Ainu most hated by Morgoth, because she has the light that he's always desired. Before the Song of the Ainur had even begun, Morgoth approached her, but she could see the darkness within his heart and rejected his advances. This was the first thing that set Morgoth down his path to lust fruitlessly and endlessly over light. Throughout the Legendarium, Varda is the only Valar that can bestow light. She's the one that places the light within the lamps, and the one who lights up the sun and moon in the sky. She placed the stars in the sky to be the first light within Arda, and when she heard that the elves were soon to wake, she drew up dew from the two trees of Valinor and used it to brighten the stars and turn them into constellations. When the elves woke in Quivenin, the stars were the first thing that they saw, and they would forever have a supreme devotion to Varda, who they called Elbereth Gilthoniel, which means Queen and Kindler of the Stars. She is the epitome of gentle wisdom and grace, and much like the light of the sun reflects off the moon, she acts as a mirror, shining the light and grace of Iluvatar across the world. The best mythic comparison I could find for her is a bit it's surprising, but it's actually Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary plays a prominent role in the Catholic faith of which Tolkien was a member, and Tolkien had a particular devotion to her. He writes that she is the foundation upon which all my own small perception of beauty, both in majesty and simplicity is founded. Though there are a few characters like Galadriel or Arwen that could be compared to Mary, I think Varda may be the most direct example. Varda is called Lady of the Stars, while Mary is called the Star of the Sea. Morgoth despises Varda for her light and wisdom, and in the Book of Revelation, Mary acts as the new Eve, crushing the head of the serpent Satan underfoot. Both Varda and Mary are called upon for help, not not worshipped as one worships God, but acting as a point of intercession between the needful and the one God. Sam calls upon Varda in the lair of Shalob, bringing her light into the darkest places, just as Catholics intercede to Mary to bring the light of Christ into their lives. Varda is the mirror image of the Catholic version of Mary, standing at the foot of Iluvatar with her spouse Manwe the chief of the Valar and ruler of Arda. Manwe was the closest and dearest Valar to Iluvatar, and he was gifted with the most complete knowledge of the plan. His delight is in the winds and the clouds, and in all the regions of the air, from the heights to the depths, from the utmost borders of the Vale of Arda to the breezes that blow in the grass. He was called Sulimo, which means Lord of the Breath of Arda, and truly, he was just as essential to the development of Arda as the air that we breathe. Manwe was wise and just and had no lust for control, which made him the perfect candidate to be the chief of the Valar. His brother was Melkor, who would become Morgoth, but Manwe would never truly come to terms with what his brother had done. Manwe was free from evil and could not comprehend it, and he knew that in the beginning, in the thought of Iluvatar, Melkor had been even as he, and he saw not to the depths of Melkor's heart, and did not perceive that all love had departed from him forever. His inability to fully grasp evil led to him releasing his brother from imprisonment, which was, of course, not a great idea. Though Manwe is a fair and firm ruler, it is vitally important that he has the other Valar there to guide him. Their different perspectives and differing facets of wisdom allow them to make decisions as a group much better than they could make decisions alone. He calls upon the others when there are important choices to be made, but for the most part, he lives with Varda on the highest mountain in the world, 
keeping an eye on everything that's going on with the help of Thorondor and his giant eagles. It's not difficult to see parallels between Manwe and the Greek god Zeus. They're both lords of the sky, the chief of the pantheon of gods, and they both live on the highest mountain in the world. However, Manwe is much less violent and much less, well, lustful than his Greek counterpart. So of course he's gonna draw inspiration from every other pagan god king, but let's continue the trend of looking towards Catholic inspiration. And this is a bit of a, a bold take, but I think that there can be a comparison made between Manwe and the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna try and be brief here, but within Catholicism, God is a trinity. This means that the one God is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But of course, Lord of the Rings is not a one-to-one -one allegory, so if it seems like anything that I'm saying is like blasphemous, um, I'm, I'm not trying to imply that Tolkien is a blasphemer. Anyway, Manwe draws some pretty serious parallels to the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit is represented by wind. For example, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit arrives and there is a great sound of gusting wind. Manwe is the governor of air and the lord of wind. The Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the voice or breath of God. And Manwe is called the breath of Arda within the text. And because of incidents like Jesus's baptism, the the Holy Spirit is often associated with birds, specifically doves, which Manwe also has a close relationship with birds. And I think what's so thrilling is that all of these comparisons that I've mentioned can be accurate at once. Manwe can encompass both the form and role of the pagan god Zeus and the symbols and theming of the Christian Holy Spirit all at once. And that's because Tolkien's valor are not incidental. They're not just a fill in the blank on a list so that someone can have a pantheon of gods to talk about when they ask about religion in Middle Earth. They are a fully realized and carefully shaped group of unique spirits. I want to propose that the best way to think about Tolkien as an author is to see him as a lens. In Middle Earth, we see history and myths and religions and stories as Tolkien sees them, filtered through his beliefs and experiences into something entirely new. The Valar are basically a pagan pantheon of gods, but because Tolkien wrote them, we get to see them more as the Catholic version of angels. He draws together well-known Greek gods, his own passion for Norse myth, the obscure Irish and Welsh fairy stories that he knows, and his firm Catholic beliefs and creates something that complements his story and his world perfectly. None of Tolkien's world building was done for world building's sake, and what you end up with is a rich, fully realized mythology that you could spend a lifetime diving into. And that's gonna do it for this week's video, because I am quite tired and losing my ability to read. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of thing. And please let me know if I missed any mythic comparisons in the comments. There are so many different facets to these characters and their role within Middle-earth, so I'm sure I missed something somewhere. I wasn't planning on doing costume changes for this video until like three days ago or so, so this video ended up being far more work than it originally was supposed to be. That being said, I am not putting out a video next Thursday, and I'm kind of uh, shuffling things around in these upcoming weeks, so keep an eye on my community tab, and if there's not a video when you thought there was gonna be a video, uh, my bad, and I swear I'm not dead. Anyway, I hope y'all had fun with this week's video, I certainly did, and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.